mainly by clinical examination. So when you get a patient with a diabetic ulcer, the first thing we need to see is touch the surrounding skin to look for evidence of temperature, warmth. If that is there, it is a surrounding, the surrounding skin is inflamed, so it is a spreading ulcer. The, the floor will be typically covered with slough. There will be no evidence of granulation tissue as you can see this wound. There is very little granulation, pockets of granulation tissue. So this is a spreading ulcer. The next is healing ulcer. Now when the wound starts healing, now I need, it is very important for us to understand what these uh, different stages are because my treatment is going to be different. If it is a spreading ulcer, my treatment is going to be different. If it is a healing ulcer, again, my treatment protocol is going to differ. Here, the surrounding skin is not inflamed. The floor is covered with granulation tissue. The edges show the bluish outline of the growing epithelium. As you can see in this picture, and there may be a slight serous discharge. So this, these are all evidence of a healing ulcer. The third is a callus ulcer. Now this is not healing. It is absolutely, it is stopped. It is not healing at all. It is not showing any evidence of healing. And there is very pale granulation in the floor of the ulcer. And there is an induration at the base, edge and surrounding skin. So clinical examination will help us to find out what is the type of clinical ulcer. Thirdly, we have the pathological classification. It could be a non-specific ulcer or a specific ulcer. Specific ulcers, remember we were talking about the tuberculous ulcer, the syphilitic ulcer. Whereas a non-specific ulcer is not related to these, but it is just infected. The, the ulcer has got infected from secondary infection and that could be any organism depending on the culture that we do. Third is the malignant ulcer, which has got a totally different uh, characteristic. So the pathological classification is going to come under non-specific ulcers, specific ulcers, and malignant ulcers. Now, the pathophysiology. Now, how do ulcers behave? We'll see the natural history of the ulcer before we go and study the natural history of a wound. Once you understand the natural history, you'll be able to understand <clears throat> what the ulcer is going to do or what can be expected when you see an ulcer. For instance, if I see a diabetic ulcer today, first I will decide whether it is healing or whether it is spreading or whether it is a callous ulcer. And having decided that, I will know what is the progress that the ulcer is going to make. So the natural history of the ulcer is the pathophysiology. It could it actually has three phases, the extension phase, the transition phase and the repair phase. Now the extension phase, the floor is covered with exudate slough. It is otherwise known as the, the spreading ulcer. This is what is seen in the spreading ulcer. The base is indurated. A lot of people have asked me, what is the difference between the floor and the base? The floor is what you see. The base is the tissue under the floor that you cannot see, but you can only feel. So you can see that the you can feel that the base is indurated, but you can see that the floor is covered with granulation. You can see that the floor is covered with slough, and the discharge may be purulent or blood stained. So when this is the phase, it means that the 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 ulcer is still growing. It is in the extension phase. So you need to uh, treat it completely with antibiotics according to the pus culture and according to you need to debride the wound. You need to clean the wound and apply dressings. The transition phase is when the wound now starts preparing for healing. All that infection is gone. The transition phase has set in and the wound is going to prepare itself for healing. The floor becomes cleaner and the slough starts separating. Then the induration of the base diminishes. The discharge becomes more serious. This is a sign that the healing is beginning to occur. So when you see, that is what I remember our uh, professors used to say they used to actually uh, smell the wound. Now that is important. The other thing important is they, you have to take out the dressing on your own. I always insist that I remove the dressing for my patient when he comes for a dressing change. When you remove the dressing, you are able to see what is the soakage in that wound in that dressing and how much of soakage, what is the color of that soakage, what is the smell that is associated with that soakage. And what is the quantity that is associated? Now, this will tell us to a certain extent how the wound is reacting to your treatment. 
and the induration diminishes. I told you the induration is what you feel. That will diminish and the discharge, as I said, becomes more serious. And small reddish granulation tissue starts appearing on the floor. That is the first sign of healing. So that tells you that you are on the right track. And lastly, the repair phase. The transformation of granulation to fibrous tissue and the epithelium extends from the shelving as a shelving edge. It's a, a flat edge and it's supposed to grow at the rate of one millimeter per day. And the healing edge that you see actually has three zones. The first zone is the whitish tissue, the outer zone, which is white in color. Now, this actually represents the, uh, the healed epithelium. The middle zone is bluish in color. The, the, the whitish layer is the epithelial layers have all developed. In the bluish layer or the middle zone, you have a granulation which is covered by a few layers of epithelium. So it appears bluish because the red is coming through a la multiple layers of epithelial cells. So it appears bluish. And lastly, the inner zone, which is reddish granulation tissue, actually it is covered by a single layer of epithelium. And this is not, that is why it appears red through this very thin layer of epithelium. You would have noticed when you apply a dressing and remove it uh, a little carelessly what happens, you will cause bleeding. And on the dressing that you remove, you will see a thin layer of translucent tissue. That is the epithelial layer which has been removed when non-adherent dressing has not been applied. So this is the layer of epithelium that we need to preserve over the granulation tissue. So now we will try to understand the process of, we have understood the process of how the ulcer is healing. What are the stages the ulcer goes through? We'll see, understand how the wound healing occurs. Now, our agenda now is to understand how wounds heal, how we can help them to heal and what to do if they don't heal on their own. Now, how do wounds heal? There are three stages of wound healing. The stage of inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. Now, when the stage of inflammation sets in, it has got a particular aim. Why is the stage of inflammation coming in? Now, this I, we have seen already that the wound is usually an acute onset uh, problem. And when there is an acute onset problem, the body is going to react. The first reaction is the inflammation. The second reaction is the proliferation. And the third reaction is the remodeling. So what is the, why does it uh, uh, react by inflammation? It wants to achieve hemostasis. You can't keep losing blood from that acute insult. It also helps to clear away the bacteria, the foreign bodies and the dead tissues. That's all. This is the aim of the first inflammatory phase. So what do we see? This is what is happening inside. That is the aim. What do we see? We see the typical five characters, calor, rubber, tumor, dolor and loss of function, which were described by Celsus in the, way back in the first century. So the warmth, the redness, the swelling, the pain and the loss of function. So who are the players? Who are going to carry out this aim of uh, removing the dead cells and uh, uh, causing hemostasis? There are five main players, the endothelial cells, the platelets, the mast cells, neutrophils and macrophages. Now, these are the main players in this stage. Now, we'll go to the next stage. Proliferation. What is the aim of this stage? It is to start the process of healing for angiogenesis and for laying down of the collagen because collagen is the main brick of the reconstruction. What do we see? We see, when we see the stage of proliferation, actually we are looking at granulation tissue. Sometimes there may be a little slough also because that is all getting separated out from the body. And who are the players involved in the stage of proliferation? Keratinocytes, endothelial cells and fibroblasts are coming in. When we talk about collagen and healing, we have to talk about fibroblasts. Then we come to the third stage of remodeling. The aim is to smoothen the scar and strengthen the scar. So the healing, the proliferation phase took it to the stage of healing and once the healing has occurred, remodeling is to smoothen the scar and strengthen the scar both on the surface and on the internal aspect. 
and what do we see when this remodeling is occurring we see the erythematous scar and we see sometimes a hypertrophic scar and who are the players here here the fibroblasts have converted themselves into myofibroblasts we see keratinocytes and again the endothelial cells now let us try to understand this process of wound healing by a typical example that i like to give uh, the bombing of chennai so imagine some day the entire chennai is bombed so when this happens the entire city is destroyed so what happens is now we need to recreate the city so when this is to be done what is the process we think about because we need to recreate the city so that because we live here so in this stage how do we now this is imagine this is a wound a sudden injury taken away all the skin from the leg for instance leg or the hand we need to reconstruct it so the and this is what happens total destruction total destruction and inhabitable you cannot uninhabitable you cannot live in this place now so you need to reconstruct so what the first thing that occurs is the people and the planners come together that is the planning town planning they come together and they decide what is to be done obviously you can't start building it on your own you need planning and who are these planners the platelets the platelets are the planners they stay they immediately come in when there is a wound they immediately because the blood vessels are injured the platelets come out and they immediately start planning and ordering everybody else about so the first thing is you need to clear the debris isn't it there's a lot of debris lying there if you want to reconstruct you have to clear all the debris so to clear the debris you need some small machines like this the bobcat they call it or the bigger machines or the much bigger earth movers for the smaller you need the small if it is a little bigger you need the bigger machines and for very large amount of debris you need all these earth movers so when we talk about a wound this is the stage of inflammation you are clearing the debris and this is brought about by the the endothelial cells the neutrophils the mast cells all these are these but they perform these function of clearing the debris so now the debris has been cleared the stage of inflammation is over so now we need to start the stage of proliferation or rebuilding so we need to rebuild to rebuild what do we need to rebuild the city you need bricks you need sand you need water you need all these resources so all these are brought in so who are all these as far as the wound is concerned in the stage of proliferation the mast cells the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts now these start the process of proliferation or rebuilding now after rebuilding this is what happens you have the basic scaffolding collagen has been laid down the building has been built but can we live in it or can it be used not at all because we need something else what do we need we need plumbing you need electrical supplies and it has to be painted and made livable so these are carried out this in the stage of remodeling by the myofibroblasts the mast cells and the keratinocytes again and the endothelial cells now this is what happens this is exactly what so you have a healing now it looks so nice i mean if chennai was like this okay so now uh, this is how the reconstruction occurs i gave the example of a city that has been totally reconstructed this is the same thing happens to the wound or the skin that is been injured will all wounds heal like this it depends some wounds heal by primary there are different types of wound healing you can have primary healing or secondary healing now this is an example of healing by primary intention a wound on the lower eyelid which has taken away the lower eyelid uh, which has taken away a flap of the lower eyelid now this has been sutured and this is the end result you can make out the edema there this is a wound that has healed by secondary intention now you can make out the difference now this is again healing by secondary intention if such large areas of destruction are not taken care of and are allowed to heal by the process that we have seen the myofibroblast the keratinocytes and the endothelial cells when they start trying to heal the wound this is what results you have a 
multiple contractures that develop or hypertrophic scars that develop that is the na nature's way of trying to heal the wound however these though the wounds have healed they are not functional so comes back to our main aim in management of wounds is not healing but function so the management of wounds is non surgical or surgical so when do we do non surgical management either as the only management it may be a very small wound you only need a non surgical management there is no need for a surgical management or it can also be needed as an adjunct to surgical management for instance a patient comes in today with a large wound you cannot do the surgery because he has got some other problems so till he goes for the definitive surgery the wound has to be managed by non surgical you can't just leave the wound there you have to manage it with non surgical management till the wound gets ready for the the definitive procedure so the non surgical management can be used for clean wounds infected wounds post operative surgical wounds in other words all types of wounds all types of wounds need non surgical management in the beginning or completely only non surgical management uh, many wounds may require surgical management at some time or the other so now so the non surgical the main stay of non surgical management is dressings why do we need dressings at all now you have got wounds or ulcers now the wounds or ulcers need a cover because you want to prevent it from getting infected you want to prevent the loss of electrolytes you want to prevent the loss of fluids from the body you want to prevent the loss of proteins so you need a cover now you need dressings to absorb the wound because if they are not absorbed you are going to have an exudating wound which is going to be more not only very cumbersome to dress it is also going to invite infection you need wound dressings so that wounds can retain moisture because a moist environment will improve the chances of healing a dry wound will stop healing it will not heal you need a moist environment for the for the wound to heal so you need dressings and lastly there are different special wound dressings healing that we will be seeing the best dressing we before we go into dressings for the wound you need to remember the best dressing for a wound is skin supposing it's a laceration closure of the skin is what is required if it is a large wound again skin if it is a large deep wound again skin again but with more tissues so when we talk about dressings there are two types one is called the there are two components of the dressing one is called the primary dressing the dressing that touches the wound is called the primary dressing and the dressing that is used to keep this primary dressing in place is called the secondary dressing we usually put a bandage or you put a plaster so that is the secondary dressing some dressings function as primary dressing only but some could function both as primary and secondary for instance if you put a bandaid okay that is also going to function as a secondary dressing because it holds the primary dressing in place now dressings are mainly absorbents i told you it has to be covered it has to cover the wound it has to absorb the exudate coming from the wound these are the two main things it has to prevent infection and it has to prevent the loss of the fluids now samson gamji used fine jewelers cotton wrapped in tiffany that is starch cotton which is called the gamji pad cotton is the main absorbent that is used in dressings but cotton obviously cannot be used directly as a primary dressing because it gets stuck to the wound and does very difficult to remove from the wound so it has been covered with tiffany or starch cotton as we call it the disadvantages of using a cloth dressing is that there is a rapid strike through when you apply a dressing because it keeps absorbing the exudate that comes out from the wound enters the cotton soaks up the cotton and then comes out to the external surface when it comes out to the external surface it is seen by the others and that is called a strike through this has very high it has got a very rapid strike through rate in cotton dressings and second important thing is it sticks to the wound 
because of the cotton which is inside the gauze and this uh, starched cotton or starched gauze linen sticks to the wound and we know that dry dressings are always a problem i told you that you need a moist environment and when this exudate comes out it leads to it gives it a very dried uh, environment there is always pain when it is removed and granulation tissue is dislodged gauze fibers can be left in the wound they they can cause a focus of infection and dehydration of the wound bed and have a cooling effect on the wound bed the dry dressings provide no bacterial barrier and release airborne organisms when removed okay so when you remove it you can cause the spread of the airborne organisms and require frequent dressing change so it is not cost effective not only that it's going to cause a lot uh, cause a lot of pain for the patient so now we'll talk about the bandages there are different types of dressings we'll see all those so soon we'll talk about the different types of primary dressings that can be done now we'll see the bandages there are different types of bandages you you can use a gauze bandage compression bandage or triangular bandage or a tube bandage or a liquid bandage now uh, layers when you apply a dressing you have got three layers the wound facing layer i told you it's the primary dressing that is the layer of the dressing that faces the wound it is the inner layer closest to the wound containing antiseptic you can put in antiseptic you can put in healing wounds whatever you want because that is the layer that is going to touch the wound second is the absorbent layer you need something to absorb the exudate that is coming out so that is the middle layer which absorbs the blood or pus or any exudate from the wound the outermost layer is the layer that supports the inner layers now uh we need to understand the wound before we start underst uh, understanding what dressing to do for a particular wound as you know there are different dressings that can be advised for different types of wounds now how do we decide on what is the dressing to be applied the color of the wound if it is black it is eshkar it represents eshkar if it is yellow that means there is a lot of exudate so large amount of exudate we use alginate dressings medium amount of uh, exudate we use hydrogel dressings and a small amount of exudate we use hydrocolloid dressings if it is red there is granulation we can use hydrocolloid dressings now this is a general principle we will understand we'll try to understand more about these dressings so when you want to decide on what dressing to do for the wound first we need to see the wound what is the color of the wound bed and what is the tissue that is exposed on the floor is it granulation is it slough or is it necrotic what is the depth of the wound and what are the visible structures is it tendon fascia or bone then we need to record the findings of the wound there are two methods mainly the ruler method that is you can use the length into width and estimate in the in the form of square centimeters and but sometimes all wounds are not on the surface sometimes you got ulceration you got sometimes wounds even that extend under the edges on the wound perimeter they extend underneath so you, it's not possible to just measure it and say by square centimeters we need to insert a moist cotton tipped applicator to see how much it goes inside to get an exact measurement of the wound then we need to observe the bed whether it is dry moist wet saturated or leaky then we need to examine the exudate from the wound the what is the color what is the consistency what is the odor and what is the volume i told you when you you do the dressings then you even taking down down the dressings should be done by the surgeon if he is really interested in managing that wound because managing the wound consists of looking at the wound and looking at the wound consists of looking at the dressing first so when the surgeon takes down the wound he will be able to assess what has been the exudate because otherwise you cannot make out the exudate the exudate can the amount of volume and the odor and the consistency can be made out better with the soiled dressing that is going to be removed then you need to examine the edges of the wound whether they are dry whether the edges are rolled under and thickened or whether they are healthy wound edges now we'll see the different types of dressings that are available the hydrocolloid 
Now, hydrocolloid consists of non-breathable dressings. They create moist conditions which help to heal. We know that moist condition is important to healing. They create moist conditions. And the surface is coated with a substance which contains the polysaccharides and polymers which absorb the water. Now, when there's an exudate, it contains a lot of water. When this hydrocolloid absorbs the water, it becomes a gel. It's, it retains that absorbed exudate in the sense that it retains the absorbed water and becomes a gel and does not let it outside. So it is very clean and it is impermeable to bacteria. So it's very effective in preventing infections. It can be used for burns and exudating wounds. Hydrogel. Now we saw about colloid that becomes converted into a gel. Now hydrogel is already in gel form. It maximizes patient comfort and reduces pain while helping to heal wounds. So hydrogel is typically uh, 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 optimal for usage in painful ulcers and painful wounds, especially necrotic wounds and leaking with not much of, because gels cannot absorb too much of fluid. It is only a colloid that can absorb. Gels cannot absorb too much of fluid. So it is better to use it for lesser amount of exudate. If there is too much of exudate, it's better to use hydrocolloid. And it can be used for infective wounds also. Now, what is alginate? Alginate dressings absorb the excess liquid and create a gel again. Whenever these substances absorb the water, they have the capacity to absorb the water, they become converted to a gel. If they are going to retain it as water, the strike through will be there. It will be seen outside. They retain the water and get converted into a gel which does not come out. So these are converted to a gel that helps to heal the wound more quickly because it keeps it in a moist environment. Now, alginate contains sodium and seaweed fibers. They are used for wounds that have high amount of drainage and burns, venous ulcers and uh, packing. It can be used for the packing of wounds and higher state pressure ulcers. It is ideal for wet wounds. The problem with alginate is, after it absorbs all the water, it makes it very dry. And that again will prevent the healing. So this can be used sometimes for wounds that have high amounts of drainage. But it is important that you must not let the wound get dry. And this alginate dressing should be removed within two or three days so that it doesn't allow the wound to dry. However, if the wound is continuing to ooze and it's moist on its own, you can leave this alginate dressing on. The next is foam dressings. Now, these foam dressings absorb exudates from the wound surface, creating an environment for faster healing. These dressings allow the water vapor to enter, keeping the area moist. The others do not allow water vapor to enter Foam dressings allow water to enter, keeping it moist, promoting faster healing, but at the same time prevent bacteria from it. If they do not prevent bacteria, obviously there is no use of this uh, dressing because it's going to get infected. It can be used for wounds of varying degrees of severity and work incredibly well for all those, especially for injuries that exhibit odor because you have air entering. So the amount of odor may not be much. And lastly, the cloth dressings we have seen. The problem with cloth dressings is the rapid strike through. You apply a cloth dressing, it is quite comfortable. But only thing is, it has got one disadvantage. It sticks to the wound. And you need to need, have another layer to have the interface. That is, the primary dressing should be another layer, which is non-adherent. So the other methods of dressings, the back dressings, electrical stimulation, and the maggot therapy. Now, what are the factors that affect wound healing? You've got different types of factors, the local factors and the systemic factors. Local factors. Now, whenever you think about a wound healing or an ulcer healing, you have to think of all these factors. Moisture. Moisture is important for healing and dry environment is important for re-epithelization. Once the re-epithelization starts, you have to ensure that it's dry. Now, I know patients will keep asking, you know, when you have a, when they have a wound and you keep dressing the wounds, they'll keep asking you, doctor, won't it be good if you leave it open? Yes, what they're asking is quite uh, sensible because once the re-epithelization starts, it is good to have a dry environment and not close it with the dressing. 
but you need to make sure that the reepithelialization re has started and for to understand the reepithelialization when it has started you need to have followed this uh, you need to understand how the ulcer is going to look when it is uh, uh, when it is spreading and how the ulcer it will look when it is healing the next is mechanical factors when you have wounds on the move mobile areas like the ankle joint or the knee obviously we all have sustained falls and we have sustained uh, abrasions and we know that the, those abrasions on the ankle and knee take quite some time to heal and they are quite painful too edema edema is an important factor that needs to be taken care of that is why for instance for an ulcer on the leg or the foot we always uh, uh, advise anti edema measures by keeping the foot elevated edema is going to go is one of the local factors that prevents the healing so whatever excellent uh, dressings you apply if the patient is going to have edema the healing is going to be delayed ionizing radiation is going to reduce the healing the technique of wound closure ischemia necrosis arterial problems foreign bodies in the wound low oxygen tension and perfusion this low oxygen tension is supposed to again cause the uh, reduced healing of the wound and that is where the hyperbaric oxygen is supposed to play a good role in healing the wounds but whatever you think of whatever the high ended whether it's a vacuum assisted closure or a hyper hbo therapy or a hyperbaric oxygen therapy we need to follow the basic factors the local factors need to be corrected and the perfusion not only the local factors we also have to consider the systemic factors inflammation caused by diabetes when there is diabetic problem you have a reduced capability in the healing and there are multiple pathophysiological mechanisms starting from the neuropathy to the angiopathy all these are going to reduce the so you need to understand what we need to know now is when i have an ulcer or when i have a wound you can have a wound in a diabetic patient or a diabetic patient developing an ulcer whatever be it we know that it is going to be slow so only when you recognize this problem you will be able to treat the underlying problem the second is a nutrition malnutrition is also to be considered when you're going to when you're going to treat a patient for healing an ulcer or a wound metabolic diseases immunosuppression connective tissue disorders and smoking we all know smoking is so important it delays the speed of the wound repair in the proliferative and inflammatory phases so the healing is going to be totally reduced it increases the complications such as wound rupture and wound and flap necrosis and decrease in the wound tensile strength and infection age increased age is a risk factor in the sense that the healing is going to be slow you need to understand all this when you start treating a patient with a wound you have understood everything about the wound you have understood how the healing is going to occur you have understood what are the local factors but all these are in a patient over 60 or 70 years of age you need to tell them that it is going to the important thing is you need to you need to understand it first and then you tell them that it's going to be slow you be but you need to continue the dressings so this is what is the result of understanding only when you are able to understand the processes you will be able to communicate with the patient which is so important for the the relationship between the doctor and the patient and lastly alcohol it affects surprisingly uh, alcohol affects the proliferative phase of healing there is a negative effect on reepithelialization wound closure collagen production and angiogenesis so alcohol yes we we used to think that alcohol is not a big factor as smoking yes not maybe but alcohol does have a detrimental effect on the healing now how would this wound heal it it is going to go through, there are different stages of wound management if it is going to be like this the management is going to be different if it is then it comes to this level here again here the dressings that they're going to use you're going to use dry dressings because you want to come it you want it to come out or you need to debride it as early as possible it is dry that means there is no inflammation if there is no inflammation it is not spreading if it is not spreading all you have to do is you can go in and debride your your aim whenever you see a wound or ulcer should be two things one what is the status in which it is now second when can i intervene 
So these are the two, whenever you see a patient with an ulcer or a wound, these are the two questions to run in your mind. What is the status of the wound now? And when can I intervene? Can I intervene now? No, I cannot intervene. Then I need to put a dressing. What dressing do I apply? Now here, this is the, you can make out the amount of slough over here. And then another one month of dressings, it became healthy and a skin graft has been applied. So now this takes time, this process takes time, but this process takes you through the different process of the wound healing and how you go along with the processes to heal the wound. So which are the wounds that will require surgery? If there are cuts and lacerations, if they are not sutured, they will heal, but you may have a little more scarring. If they are sutured, obviously you'll have a less, lesser amount of scarring. If they are superficial second degree wounds, they will heal and there will be less scarring. If there are deep second degree wounds, they may heal. And even if they do heal, the, there will be more scarring. This is because when you have a deep second degree wound, the amount of involvement of the dermis is more. And dermis is important for the healing. When the more amount of dermis is involved, the number of reepithelization uh, areas. Now, we all know that the reepithelization occurs from the pilosebaceous unit. So, when you have more of the depth of dermis which is lost, the number of pilosebaceous units from where the reepithelization is going to occur is less. So, the amount of thickness or the strength of the skin, that the scar that is formed is going to be less. So, naturally the scar, there is more amount of collagen deposition in an effort to make it stronger. So, you have a hypertrophic scar. So, deep second degree wounds, even though they may heal on their own, it is better to do a skin grafting or a procedure because you want to have a lesser amount of scarring and lesser amount of contracture. Because again, I keep saying this again and again, our aim is not just to heal the wound, our aim is to give back function. And full thickness wound will not heal at all unless it heals by contracture and scarring, which we don't again want. So ulcers which will need surgery, basic problem must be corrected first. In a wound, it is different. If it is ulcer, there is a basic problem. There is an internal factor that has caused the ulcer formation. That must be corrected first. Then the diabetic, condi the diabetic condition or the arterial problem or the venous problem, whatever, it has to be corrected first. Then you need to consider the, ul the ulcer and the stage of the ulcer. So the wound closure intentions, we have seen the primary intention where the healing of the wound is without tissue loss. You can have fast healing, lesser scarring, like sutured wounds and reduced fractures. And secondary intention, which is implemented when there has been a significant loss in tissue or tissue damage, the wound is allowed to granulate. Granulation results in a broader scar and the healing process is low. That is after removing a tooth, that is the commonest uh, example of uh, secondary healing. Now, the surgical management of the wound is going to consider, now we have a wound, it is not healing on its own, or it will not heal on its own according to our understanding of the wound, or it will heal on its own but result in contractures, then we need to follow what is the reconstructive ladder. So that will be the, uh, the session. We will talk about the flaps, skin grafts, and the reconstructive ladder and the different types of flaps that can be used and of course the classification of flaps. So we come to the end of this session. We'll have the quiz question of the day. In a case of gynecomastia, if there is severe hypertrophy, that is more than 500 grams of breast tissue with grade 1 ptosis, under the Rorick system, it is classified as grade 1 or 2 or 3 or 4? Grade 3. Grade three. Who, is the, who answered? Ronak? Yes, grade 3. You all agree? Yes. Everybody agrees to grade 3? Okay. You all agree? Good. So, the, is it grade 1? 
two or three or four. Answer is grade three. He is right. Whoever answered is right. Grade three. So, what are the different grades? I mean, what is this Rorik uh, grading? So, Rorik developed the following classification system for gynecomastia. Grade one is minimal hypertrophy, that is less than 250 grams of breast tissue without ptosis. Grade two is moderate hypertrophy, 250 to 500 grams without ptosis. Again, there is no ptosis. When there is grade one ptosis and severe hypertrophy, that is for more than 500 grams of breast, breast tissue, it is grade three, according to the Rorick classification. And grade 4 is severe hypertrophy, the same thing, more than 500 grams with grade 2 or grade 3 doses. So that is the uh, answer. Good. So you are able to remember the Rorick grading. So as I said, the next session will be on surgical management of wounds, including grafts, flaps, classification of flaps and the reconstructive ladder. You all see wounds, isn't it? We all see wounds, we all see ulcers day in and day out. Now, it is interesting to know about the basic processes that go on in the wounds, how they heal and uh, I mean, what, uh, what are the processes that are going on? And uh, uh, so that is why I wanted to take a, a small session on wounds and ulcers and the surgical management where we are involved. The whole problem is sometimes we think that we only are there to do surgery. That is not the fact. The, the entire concept of surgery is based on understanding of the basics. Once we understand the basics, our surgical technique, our surgical principles will be more sensibly applied to the healing of the wound. Are there any questions? We've all seen a lot of acute wounds, isn't it? Acute wounds and the management. Uh, the, 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 a lot of people say that when you have an acute wound, a lot of contamination, they say that's an infected wound. That is what, there are certain concepts that we need to shed. We need to tell others that it's not an infected wound, it is a contaminated wound. And what contamination can get in, can get out. The contamination got in because of the road traffic accident. What got in can also come out. So that is what we need to, basic concepts that we need to uh, understand. Okay. So, so there are uh, one or two questions in the chat box. Okay, sir. Uh, sig sir, significance of crepe bandage in management of wound, kindly enlighten. Yeah. Now, I was telling you about the edema, that you don't want edema. Now, when you don't want it, why edema is uh, against, I mean, is going to slow down the process of wound healing is that when edema sets in, the amount of extracellular fluid becomes more. When the amount of extracellular fluid becomes more, there is a dilution of the factors that are going to help in the wound healing. So to reduce this, compression bandage is very useful. Compression bandage must be applied, but not, that is, I have seen people uh, who apply the compression bandage even when they are lying down. That is not needed. Compression bandage to be applied only when the foot, for instance, when it is on the foot, when it is kept down, when it is kept dependent, then you need to apply. On the hand, for instance, you, uh, the crepe bandage is going to uh, give a compression which is going to reduce the amount of, reduce the amount of extracellular fluid that is going to collect in the tissues. If you let it on its own, the inflammation will cause the extracellular fluid to collect. But your crepe bandage or compression is going to, but at the, the, the same time we need to remember that it should not be too tight. If it is too tight, again, it's going to cause a reduction in the perfusion. And perfusion, you remember one of the factors that we talked about was the perfusion and oxygen saturation. So compression will definitely re, re, increase the rate of healing provided it is, uh, has been applied at the correct pressure. There are different types of crepe bandage with different uh, thickness. The thicker the crepe bandage, the more pressure is going to apply. So when you apply a crepe bandage for uh, for healing, for a quicker healing of a wound, you should remember that it should not be too tight nor too loose. So the another question, uh, whether classification as crush injury, burst injury, penetrating injury, avulsion injury has any significance? 
yes now when you talk about for instance if i say there is a crush injury a crush injury uh, the important thing is i should understand what is the difference between a crush injury and a degloving injury and a penetrating injury a crush injury means that the tissues are crushed and the edges of the skin are rag, ragged but there is no loss in say so what i see on the outside is what is the damage that has occurred whereas with the penetrating injury the amount of damage that i see is actually more because the damage is also gone inside along the area of penetration a blast injury is the same thing the damage is not only what i see it is also gone inside but more than what i can see inside for instance you have a penetrating injury for, with a knife or on the hand so what you are going to expect is there is going to be injury to the structures in this area what you are going to see outside is only a small laceration but that's not obviously the injury the penetrating injury has caused injury to the underlying tissues but it is only in that area the same thing if it had been for instance uh, a person has, has been shot in the hand you can see a small wound the entry wound you can see an exit wound what is the damage inside it is much more than what is through this area if i put in a knife through this or if i put in a bullet through this when i put in a knife the injury is only in that particular area where the knife has gone through it is not going to affect the surrounding tissues whereas if it is a blast injury it is going to affect the surrounding tissues also so obviously my management should differ it should be more extensive when i'm talking about a blast injury so the correct uh, uh, the correct uh, adjective that we use or the correct term that you give for the wound is very important it gives us an idea of what is happening there i hope that has answered the question whoever yeah, asked there, there is one more question sir yes, the sir. last question what is the difference between primary repair delayed primary repair and secondary repair yeah primary repair is usually done that i thought i'll be talking about in the next session but primary repair is done before the stage of inflammation the the sets in now i told you inflammation is going to consist of uh, calor ruber dolor and all that that is going to set in about 24 to 48 hours after the injury it's going to start immediately but it reaches a peak by 24 to 48 hours and then proceeds so when you have the primary injury when you have an injury within 24 to 48 hours if you are able to manage it it is called primary repair or reconstruction you can even do a primary reconstruction if i have a wound on my hand i can suture it immediately if the patient has come to me within 24 hours if the patient has come to me after 24 hours if you look at it you can make out some amount of maceration on the edges so that i will have to consider that i will not do a suturing immediately you also would not do a suturing because it will obviously not take up the suture because the inflammation has started coming in edema would have set in when you put in your sutures you're going to have a very bad scar it may get infected so there that is primary or if i have a skin loss over here the patient has had a skin loss and has presented to me now it is within 6 hours to 24 hours i can immediately give a flap cover immediately there is no there is only a contamination i'll remove all that contamination give a good wash and give a flap cover the same patient when he comes to me after 48 hours i know that the inflammation stage has set in i cannot do a, uh, a primary cover i cannot give a flap cover so when do i give a flap cover shall i wait for one month no i can do it in 10 days because the patient has come to me i can treat it i can prevent it from getting infected normally a wound occurs within 24 hours it is clean it is still clean contaminated i can go ahead and do a primary repair if i leave it after 24 hours by 48 hours the inflammation sets in by 3 to 5 days the stage of infection will set in if i have not treated it if i have recognized it at 48 hours i will give antibiotics and appropriate dressings so by the end of 10 days i will have a clean wound again again the clean contaminated wound i can give a flap cover whereas if the patient comes to me after say about 3 weeks when it is an infected wound i cannot do a delayed primary so primary is within 24 hours delayed primary is after the stage of inflammation 
then you have avoided infection. So after no infl inflammation is there, inflammation stage is gone and there is no infection, you can do a delayed primary. Or if it gone beyond that, there has been a stage of infection or there has been a delay and the fibrosis has started, remodeling has started, then you have to do a secondary. I'll give you an example with a cut tendon. If the tendon is cut over here, Within 24 hours, I can do a primary repair. If the patient has come to me after two days with a sutured wound, the wound has been sutured at some, some other hospital, patient has come to me. Now, has come to me after three days. Okay. Now, if I go in, I can suture it, but I do not know the status of the wound. It may be infected, potentially infected. So, I'll have to wait till the suture removal is done, which is at 10 days. If at 10 days, when I do the suture removal, and I find that the wound has healed well, that means there is no infection. Inflammation over, no infection, I can go ahead and do a delayed primary. So what is delayed primary is nothing but you have delayed the same primary treatment after the stage, you have overcome the stage of infection, you have avoided the stage of infection, you can go to delayed primary. If you are not able to avoid the stage of infection and it goes through the infection stage, you cannot do a delayed primary, you have to do a secondary reconstruction. Dr. Abhishek Verma wants to know whether dog bites should be sutured. Dog bites, there was a time when they said dog bites should not be sutured. Dog bites can be and should be sutured immediately. When the patient comes to you, start on the anti rabies treatment or whatever the treatment is being prescribed by the medical professional, medical person, person. And you start a good wound wash. Your the dog bite wound that you're going to have is not going to get uh, 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 I mean rabies because of that wound. The the whole problem is a secondary infection that can develop. So what you need to do is a thorough wound wash and suturing is absolutely indicated. Good antibiotics, of course, and under anti rabies uh, uh, con uh, cover. Sir, he has a request. He says, Sir, please also give examples of various dressing materials like alginates, hydrocolloids available in the market in your next lecture. Yeah, sure. I'll give you an example. I wanted to give it today, but I didn't want to make it look like a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll give you. I mean, it's easier to understand. I agree. I'll give you examples next time. Thank you. Any more questions, gentlemen? No more questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Nice Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. See you next week.